listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 15, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, How the Immune System Works, from some PIRAC chapters 8 through 12. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's chief of the section of clinical immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Right. So our final talk for Lawrence Home Pirates textbook, How the Immune System Works, and we are going to go through chapters 8 through 12, so several ones to go through. Um, so let's get started. Our learning objectives today are to have a broader idea about restraining the immune system, self-tolerance and MHC restriction, immunological memory, intestinal immune system, immune system gone wrong, and vaccines. So first we are going to talk about how the immune system is attenuated. So there are several ways and the first one I wanted to talk about was inducible Tregs. So inducible Tregs as the name suggests are induced. Um, so there are two types of Tregs, natural Tregs or thymic Tregs and then peripheral Tregs or inducible Tregs. So inducible Tregs are also called peripheral Tregs. Um, the example given here is about intestine, and so as we learned, the antigen-presenting cells present the antigen along with the cytokine milieu, so basically whatever the environment of the cytokines is, depending on that, the naive T cells decide which type of cells they want to become. So for example, with the naive helper T cells, they could become Th1, Th2, uh, Th17. So um, similarly, there are cells, T cells, that in presence of TGF beta cytokine um, get um, get the Th0 cells to become IT regs. So these TGF beta basically um, all not only induce IT regs, but that's also released from IT regs along with another cytokine, IL-10. These cytokines from IT regs have further functions. So basically, these are the only two cytokines that are anti-inflammatory. Rest of the cytokines that we talk about are inflammatory in nature. So TGF-beta, how does it work? It reduces proliferation of T cells. And then um, specifically CTLs become less vicious killers in presence of TGF-beta. IL-10 blocks co-stimulatory signals and so it is difficult to activate naive T cells in presence of IL-10. So apart from that, um, how does it work? How does the immune system, immune response die down? So the reason is that for a lot of the weapons that are produced during the inflammatory or immune response, um, those weapons have a short half-life. Uh, for example, for neutrophils, it's days. Natural killer cells, it's a, about a week. Macrophages overall can last for a very long time. Um, the resting stage um, when interferon gamma is from, comes from the NK cells um, is present, it has a long life, but if there there is a certain amount where it can last, but once they are activated and undergo activation, that life uh, span decreases. Dendritic cells, and they have about, they last about a week in lymph node, and these are the cells that go to the lymph node to activate T cells. So once the dendritic cells that are activating the T cells die down, um, that activation signal is gone. Plasma B cells, um, uh, uh, plasma cells and B cells have about five day of half life, and antibodies, as we know, have a short half life with the longest one for IgG, which is three weeks. So, so the weapons have a short half life, but what about the antigen itself? Uh, so, once the immune system controls the infection, say it's a flu virus, the flu virus is um, is killed there is no longer that antigen present 
to activate this, uh, the immune system. So there is less antigen presenting cell activation because the antigen is no longer present. And because of the less APCs that are activated, there is less activation of adaptive immune system. So there has to be a way for the immune response to be controlled at every step depending on where the immune response is. So say the immune response has gone through the stages where the infection is is uh, taken care of. Those things that we talked about, like the antigen going down or um, going down an amount or the uh, different cells having short half, half uh, life works. But there are times when you want the T cells that are activated to be controlled and deactivated as soon as possible as well. So there is a system going for that, how to deactivate the immune system. So there are some, um, so there is almost like decommissioning of T cells to say you'd no longer need to be, to continue to fight the infection. And that's provided by uh, these two surface molecules called CTLA-4 and PD-1. So CTLA-4, remember when the T cells need activation, so these the ones that need activation are naive T cells, they come in contact with the antigen that's presented to them by MHC on antigen-presenting cells. When that happens, they need a second signal that is given by CD28 and B7, B7, uh, sorry, B71 and B72. Now, that's for the naive T cells. In terms of a cell that's already activated, that activated cell, apart from, uh, from um, expressing CD28 on its surface, can also express CTLA-4 on its surface. And CTLA-4 has 1,000 times more affinity for B71, B72. <clears throat> so if CTLA-4 is present, Likely CD28 doesn't have a chance to uh, interact with B7, B7 too. Um, so in those cases, CTLA4 takes over and it is, uh, the, these cells are um, difficult to reactivate. Compared to CTLA4, PD1 uh, signal is a little different. So again, activated T cells express PD1. Um, PD-1 and PD-1 ligand is present on inflamed cells. So say in the liver there are activated T cells trying to fight a virus and the PD-1 ligand is on the inflamed cells, so you say hepatic cells. So in those cases the T cells will actually, uh, that are expressing PD-1 can bind, that PD-1 can bind to PD-1 ligand and that prevents the proliferation of the T cells in that tissue. So that's how the immune response is, deact immune system is deactivated using CTLA-4 and PD-1. So say, despite those signals, there are some T cells that continue to fight. So in those cases, there is something called AICD that helps to, uh, to control the immune response. So when T cells multiply several, sorry, um, undergo multiple times re-stimulation or reactivation, <clears throat> those T cells are eliminated after a certain time. And that happens uh, because um, there, are, there is a ligand called, uh, sorry, a molecule called fast ligand on the cytotoxic T cells that bind fast protein. So the, when the T cells are naive, they are insensitive to, uh, the, uh, to binding to fast ligand. So naive T cells are spared from this AICD. But once the T cells are activated and they have undergone um, multiple sets of proliferation, those T cells now become more and more sensitive so that that fast protein on them can bind to the fast ligand on CTLs. And that signal, fast and fast ligand interaction, leads to uh, a series of events that leads to apoptosis. All right. So, again, how does the immune system get controlled after it has done its job? Um, let's just kind of revise the steps. There are cells that um, cells that helps to restrain the immune system, such as the Tregs. Uh, 
the weapons that are used in the immune response have short half-life. The antigen that was initially important to, to activate the immune response is no longer available to activate the immune system. And if the T cells are already activated, there are some surface molecules like CTLA-4, PD-1 that help to control that T cell response. And then if T, -cell, uh, T cells continue to keep going, they are killed by apoptosis using FAS and FAS ligand signals. Questions about this before we go on to talk about tolerance? All right, so let's talk about central tolerance. So in general, now we are talking about uh, how um, uh, during the, the phase of development of T cells, how is central tolerance induced? So remember, thymus is the primary lymphoid organ. It has different parts. We had looked at this. It has a cortex and medulla. Um, again, we had looked at that plumbing. There are no incoming lymphatics, and there are no HEVs in thymus. But there is somehow there is restricted entry of thymocytes that come from the bone marrow. These thymocytes are destined to become T cells. Initially, when they come in, they do not have CD three or T cell receptor on them. They do not have CD4 or CD8, which are the co-receptors on them. When they go through the thymus, they are going to try and form that TCR. <clears throat> and once they are, once a cell is successful in making TCR, it's going to interact with an antigen and MHC. And based on that, it's going to either become CD4 positive or CD8 positive, so single positive cells. So initially, they become double positive, and then they become single positive, and we looked at this last time. Once they become those T cells, they exit the corticomedullary junction via blood, right? So how is central tolerance induced? So again, we're going to look at this. These cells are initially... Um, they are coming into the thymic cortex. They do not have either of those CD3 or TCR on them. And then they become double positive when they are in the cortex. Now, during this time, these T cells that do not have either TCR or CD4 or CD8 on them, they also do not have FAS antigen on them. But they have anti-apoptotic uh, signal on them or uh, surface molecule on them, which is BCL2. So these cells <clears throat> are not so prone to undergo apoptosis. But once they become double positive cells, they start having higher fast antigen on them and low anti-apoptotic signals. So these cells can undergo apoptosis pretty quickly. So that's how they become, if they do not pass the, some of the selection criteria, in the thymus, then they undergo apoptosis, and they are very prone to apoptosis. So there are, in at this stage of double positive T cells, there are about 60 million cells in the uh, double positive T cells in the thymic cortex. There, they undergo something called positive selection. So what is positive selection? Positive selection. So there is this is like a test for uh, the developing T cells. And for that test, they have to answer some questions that are given to them by um, the thymus. And who gives them that test? So in the cortex, that test is given by cortical thymic epithelial cells. And uh, they are asked if these T cells are capable of interacting with MHC um, molecule, self-MHC. If they can, if the, the answer is yes, so that's the, the reason why it's called positive selection. So any cell that replies yes to that question, that means that they are able to interact with self-MHC, then they, are, they pass that test and continue to survive. Any cell that cannot interact with self-MHC, in that case, it's not going to be useful because it cannot interact with the self-MHC and the antigen that's presented to them on that MHC. And in that case, it's not going to be functional. So that T cell is killed. So based on that, depending on whether it's an, uh, it interacts with MHC class 1 or MHC class 2, it can become a um, 
uh, cell that has either CD4 or CD8 on them. So it's called a single positive cell. As it go undergoes this testing, it also moves from cortex to the medulla. In the medulla, there are other cells like medullary thymic epithelial cells, thymic dendritic cells. So MTEX, me M medullary thymic epithelial cells, the MTEX are really important in uh, uh, giving another test to these developing T cells. That's called negative selection. What these MTEX do is they can present different antigens from all the body parts to the developing T cells, so self antigens. They present that self antigen on the MHC to these T cells. Remember, these are self antigens. So if, and the question that these MTEX ask the T cells are, are you able to recognize the self antigen presented to you on that MHC? And if the, the correct answer is no, because if they actually can uh, recognize uh, the self antigens, then they are self-reactive and that could be cause autoimmunity. So the correct answer is no, that they cannot uh, recognize uh, self antigens. So if they do recognize that antigen, then they are killed. They undergo apoptosis. If they, re they reply no and they cannot recognize that antigen, then they survive. And so once they have undergone positive and negative selection, they graduate. So these thymic graduates are called recent thymic immigrants. So they exit the thymus and are called recent thymic immigrants. So remember when we started out with double positive cells, we had about 60 million of these developing T cells. <clears throat> about Only about 2 million of them uh, go, uh, are can actually pass these positive selection and negative selection tests so that they can graduate. And this process about, takes about two weeks uh, for selection. All right, so let's see how is tolerance built over time. So that was just the central tolerance, right? The self antigens are presented to the developing T cells and if they recognize any of them, those self antigens, then they get killed. Now, what if they actually, um, there are T cells that react to self antigens that escape the thymus? What happens then? In those cases, this tolerance by ignorance comes into play. Now, remember, we had talked about how T cells, naive T cells recirculate. What do they do? Naive T cells come out of the thymus and go to secondary lymphoid organs. And they go from one secondary lymphoid organ to second one and, sec and the next one, and they recirculate. So they continue to recirculate from one secondary lymphoid organ to another. So if you think about it, this traffic pattern is not just that it happens by chance. It has a particular purpose because these naive T cells do not go into tissues. They are not activated. So they are just looking for a, an antigen that they can recognize. So they are going from one dating bar to another looking for that antigen. So they are not really going into, say, liver or kidney tissue. They are going into the lymph nodes surrounding them, but they are not going into the tissue. Now, the self antigens are in the tissue. So typically, a naive T cell, if even if it's, um, it's reactive to a self antigen, it doesn't come across that antigen because um, th there are not enough self antigens that are in the tissue that come in the secondary lymphoid organs. There are abundant self, and, uh, self antigens in secondary lymphoid organs that are also present in the thymus. So that way, those uh, self antigens are likely the ones that were already presented to T cells they are, uh, and the ones that were self-reactive T cells were already eliminated there. So in case the rare self antigen in thymus are also, uh, in case they come across that antigen, we'll come, we'll talk about the next step. But in general, there are the rare self antigens in thymus are also rare in secondary lymphoid organs where these naive T cells are circulating and recirculating. So there is not enough antigen to cross the, across link the TCRs. So that's called uh, um, tolerance by ignorance. So again, in those secondary lymphoid organs, there are other T cells or 
Tr eggs that are present that help to the T cells not to react against self antigen that might be present in the secondary lymphoid in enough amount to cross link the TCR. So that's the next step. So natural T regs. So we talked about peripheral T regs or inducible T regs. Now now we are talking about natural T regs or um, central T regs. So these are present in the thymus. These are CD4 positive T cells that are also positive for a surface molecule called FOXP3. So FOXP3 CD4 positive cells um, that are produced in the thymus enter the lymph nodes and other secondary lymphoid organs. And they protect against the T cells that can react against self antigens. So let's talk about peripheral tolerance. Now peripheral tolerance is different from peripheral Tregs, regs right? So now we are talking about this, the naive T cells that have made it outside the thymus. They were recirculating in the secondary lymphoid organs. But what if some of these naive T cells escape into the tissues? And maybe one of that is actually specific for a self antigen on the, in, in that tissue. Um, for a tissue cell. So what happens if it makes it to that tissue and it has, uh, it, it is self-reactive against an antigen in that tissue? What happens is even if it binds, so the TCR on that naive T cell binds to that self-antigen, there is no co-stimulation. There is very low level of MHC proteins unlike for these tissue cells, so unlike the antigen presenting cells. So even though they can interact with them, they do not cause activation because there is no second signal. And that's called energy. So there can be tolerance by ignorance, which is a little different from energy when we talk about these uh, different types of tolerance. And then the next part, uh, next type of tolerance is tolerance due to AICD uh, and we just talked about AICD uh, now we are talking about AICD in terms of tolerance right so self-reactive naive t-cells if they escape thymus they they also escape the secondary lymphoid organs and they enter the tissue say they even though we are saying that that's not they do not usually um, have enough antigen or MHC molecules or co-stimulation, what if they do get activated and what if they start causing problems? Even in those, time, uh, those circumstances, those T cells are going to be activated a few times and they are going to undergo activation-induced um, apoptosis called AICD. So those are the different types of tolerance. And those, when we were talking about all of this, we were just talking about T cells. So now we talk about B cell tolerance. It's pretty similar to T cell tolerance. So there's not, we are just going to point out the differences because most of the tolerance is pretty similar to T cells. So the first part is B cells, the central tolerance. How do they build that tolerance? For T cells, it occurs in the thymus. It has to undergo positive selection and um, negative selection when that TCR is formed, right? For B cells, the gene, re gene segment recombination takes place. And if the BCR is specific for a self antigen, then the B cell uh, BCR formation is not called successful. In those circumstances, those B cells get a second chance at editing that BCR to see if it can come up with a different gene segment, gene rearrangement that is not specific for a self antigen. So that's called receptor editing. This type of uh, receptor editing is not a possibility for T cells, but it is a possibility for B cells. So a little different from T cells. But other than that, say they came, they, uh, the B cells were able to make a successful BCR gene rearrangement, those B cells or naive B cells now that are mature, they also are released in circulation and they also follow, naive B cells follow that traffic pattern of moving from uh, secondary lymphoid organ, one secondary lymphoid organ to another. So most of the time, say a B cell that is self-reactive rarely sees the antigen 
that is in the secondary lymphoid organ. So the typical self-antigens are in the tissue that are not present in secondary lymphoid organs. So when they are recirculating, they are not going to come across that antigen. So that's tolerance by ignorance. Similar to T-cells, say a naive B-cell that self-reactive enters the tissue and is able to meet the, the antigen that it's specific for, then it, they do not get activated because there is no second signal. So that's tolerance by energy. And then overall, we know that when B-cells get activated in the follicles, right, where, where do the B-cells get come across the antigen that they are specific for? They are circulating in the secondary lymphoid organs. And when the... Um, and they are typically in the follicular region. So they are in the primary follicles, but when they get activated and start proliferating, they make a germinal center and make secondary follicles. That germinal center is important because as the B cells multiply, they uh, pro and pro uh, the different types of B cells proliferate in those follicles, sometimes they undergo hypermutation, right? So when they are undergoing hypermutation, sometimes they can actually mutate that um, the BCR to in fact cause a self-reacting B cell. So instead of making the affinity better for an antigen that it's, uh, that it's, um, that it is able to uh, attach to, sometimes that hypermutation causes that B cell to be uh, self-reactive. So when that, those causes the self-reacting B cells to interact with the FDCs in that germinal center, they only, typically the uh, FDCs only display the opsonized antigen. And that's a reason because they are opsonized antigens, those are typically not the self-antigens. So the complement doesn't attach to self-antigen. So typically the ones that undergo hypermutation are the ones that are interacting with the FTCs. Typically the ones that are undergoing this hypermutation are going to be the ones that are, as I said, for the um, non-self-antigen, but say if there is an antigen, self-antigen, that it interacts with and hypermutates to self-reactive one, then it's not going to get uh, co-stimulation from the follicular T helper cells so that it doesn't become a successful B cell that gets out of the uh, lymphoid organ. So we talked about T cells and B cells. Do NK cells um, have um, tolerance. So remember, the NK cells have also are also supposed to uh, help with tolerance because you don't want NK cells to be killing self antigens and cell and uh, non damaged cells, right? So the NK cells have two different types of receptors on them. They are inhibitory receptors and activating receptors. Inhibitory receptors are specific for class one MHC. So if there is a class 1 MHC on a cell, it's likely not damaged cell, and it's a cell. So NK cells can make out if it's a self um, antigen or a non-self target. And if, they, if the inhibitor receptor does not come across that class 1 MHC, then it can recognize that it's a damaged cell or a non-self uh, target and in those cases it can kill that target. NK cells that do not recognize self MHC are rendered non-functional. So that's how the positive selection for NK cells works. I believe that should be it for tolerance. So questions at this point about tolerance or anything else that we talked about. Let's move on. Talk about immunological memory. So is there a memory for innate immune cells versus just the adaptive immune cells? And we know that the adaptive immune cells have a really good memory, but innate immune system also has some memory, just the memory is a little different. The memory is for the broader class of molecular patterns rather than for specifics of a uh, specific microbe. For example, the TLRs 
uh, can recognize the same molecular pattern each time. And K cells have more quick and powerful response on subsequent invasion, um, but it has to be for a known molecular pattern. <coughs> but not particularly, it doesn't have an adaptive memory that changes over time. So innate memory is present, it's just not as sophisticated as for the uh, adaptive. So let's talk about B cell memory. Here is a naive B cell. Naive B cell can become an activated B cell and then it becomes a plasma cell. <clears throat> we know that the plasma cells are factories of uh, antibodies. So they produce a lo large amount of antibodies. So when we talk about those factories, we are typically talking about short-lived plasma B cells that produce a lot of antibodies for quick response. However, some of the activated B cells can become long-lived plasma B cells or central memory B cells. So when there is a central memory B cells, these continue to stay in the lymph nodes or sec other secondary lymphoid organs. And what they do is, over time, whenever there is a need for the, those antibodies, they convert themselves to plasma, long-lived plasma B cells. So those are called central memory B cells. The activated B cells can also become long-lived plasma B cells, so they differentiate into plasma B cells, but these are not the ones that produce a lot of antibodies, but they continue to stay in the bone marrow, right? These activated B cells then differentiate into plasma B cells. These plasma B cells will go to the bone marrow and just produce antibodies, and they have a short half-life. Compared to long-lived plasma B cells, which also live in bone marrow and produce small amounts of antibodies. So the difference is these ones live in bone marrow versus central memory B cells are in secondary lymphoid organs. T cell memory, again, naive T cell gets activated. It becomes a short-lived effector T cell, right? So effector T cell can be a helper subset or an CTL. And once it has done its job, it will be killed. However, some of these activated T cells can become central memory T cells. Central memory T cells continue to stay. So activated T cell is in the lymph node, right? Sorry, our secondary lymphoid organ like lymph node. And some of them become central memory T cells that continue to stay in secondary lymphoid organs. And when needed, they can actually get converted to the activated T cell and effector T cells. Or... Once it becomes an effector T cell, that effector T cell can end up in the tissue, right, to do its job. But some of those cells can continue to stay as memory effector T cells, and those memory effector, not central memory, effector memory cells, those can continue to stay in that tissue and be reactivated when needed. So again, two different types of T cell memory. Again, let's come back to the concept of innate versus adaptive memory. We talked about how innate memory is not updatable, um, and it's same for all the humans, versus the adaptive memory is expandable and it's specific to a person, so it could be different from one <coughs> human to another. <clears throat> so the properties of adaptive memory cells, so in general, when a um, naive T cell or a naive B cell is present, it, the one that is specific for a particular antigen would be maybe one in a million cells. Once it's activated, it's going to proliferate a lot and then it's going to take care of that infection. Once the infection dies down, most of those activated cells are going to be killed. However, there is a small cohort of those cells that stays behind as memory cells. Now, in general, it's very small compared to how many were present when there was an active infection. But even that small number of cells are way more than one in a million cells that were present as naive cells that were specific for that antigen. So the memory cells are still more than were for that one particular antigen. They are more in number than the naive cell. They are also easier to activate. Why is that? They need less MHC and peptide amount to get activated, and they don't need co-stimulation. They had that co-stimulation, they were activated at some point, so now they don't need co-stimulation. 
And then in cases of memory B cells, that memory can is upgraded. What does that mean? So say a memory B, sorry, say a B cell got activated and then it underwent hypermutation and class switching. And so now these are B cells are specific for say IgG instead of IgM uh, uh, class of B cells. And then they underwent somatic hypermutation where their affinity is way better than they, when they started. Now, those ones are going to be converted to long-lived plasma cells. So when the antibodies are produced, instead of going from IgM and then switching over to IgG, when these long-lived plasma cells are activated, they go directly to producing IgG or whichever antibody they are specific for. So the class-switched memory and matured affinity uh, memory is what we call as the upgraded um, memory of B cells. All right, so switching gears again. So we talked about how the immune system is restrained. We talked about how we need to have tolerance for all of these cells that is important because otherwise it will be um, these cells can actually react to self antigens and cause autoimmune issues. And we talked about how the memory plays a role. Now we talk about intestinal immune system. So intestinal immune system is pretty uh, neat. It's different from the systemic immune system, right? Each of these, um, some of these organs have a specific type of immune system which varies from the systemic immune system. So let's talk about what's different. So there is an epithelial barrier, so that there is a physical barrier to for the intestinal immune system provided by epithelial cells. On the top of the epithelial cells, there are uh, there is mucus that's produced by particular mucus-producing cells like goblet cells. That mucus forms a thick layer <clears throat> on the top of the epithelial layer, and that mucus also provides a barrier. Apart from physical barrier by the mucus uh, that's produced, they also have antibacterial proteins like lysozyme and defensins. And depending on where you are talking in the intestine, there are more alpha defenses versus beta defensins. And apart from just providing that barrier and that antibacterial uh, enzymes that are produced, it actually has an effect where it basically sweeps the bacteria or any other microbes that are coming in, in from the lumen. So <clears throat> because it can move, it can take some of these bacteria and microbes along with them. The bacteria that are present in the intestine also have a role in providing, uh, uh, providing protection in the uh, intestinal immune system. So the commensals, so the bacteria that are commensals, break down the protein, carbohydrates and they make some vitamins and they compete with the pathogens that provides the immune response um, or sorry, protection. So we all know that. Now let's see how those commensals don't produce an inflammatory response, whereas if there is a pathogen, there is an immune response. So it's really important to understand that intestine is a place where we, we would find lots of commensals, lots of other antigens that are harmless and really important for the body, like the food antigens that are coming in. So the, the the goal of the intestinal immune system is to keep a harmony among all the things that are go all the, the processes that are going on and all the antigens that are coming uh, they are coming across it's only when there is a pathogen is when an inflammatory response is needed <clears throat> so in general there are non inflammatory macrophages in the intestine that basically are not going to produce cy uh, cytokines even when they come across an antigen. They are non-inflammatory macrophages. However, there are some resident macrophages and dendritic cells that are present and what they do is if they do come across a pathogen and they get activated, then they are going to be um, uh, presenting those antigens to the T cells and those T cells are typically the ones that are Th17 type that bring inflammatory cells such as neutrophils to that site. So that's the inflammatory response. 
How about the B cell response? So t those T cells get, get activated and maybe it's TH17, sometimes TH1 type of response, and sometimes, unfortunately, TH2 type of response, which we typically don't want in the intestine because that can cause um, reactions to self and uh, sorry, harmless antigens, just such as food antigens. But sometimes, um, apart from the T cells, you need B cell response and the B cells that are present in the lamina propria of the intestine are typically um, present in a cytokine environment where they, it is easy for them to class switch to IgA. And this IgA uh, class switching can occur even without T helper cell uh, uh, help. So remember, when the, the class switching or hypermutation takes place for B cells, typically it's in the germinal centers with help of follicular helper T cells. And sometimes, such as in intestine, that help is not needed. So how do these B cells uh, decide um, to class switch to IgA? This is driven by retinoic acid. So the intestinal dendritic cells produce retinoic acid and that helps in that environment uh, is important for B cells to switch to IgA. So now that Ig, we know that there is a lot of IgA in the intestine, what does it do? So this is secretory IgA and so what it does is that IgA is produced, it um, it gets transcytose. So once it's produced, it gets transcytose to the lumen and it binds to the lumen bacteria. And it does not let, um, let that bacteria enter into the um, intestinal tissue. So it almost acts like the border security. It's just present in along that border along that intestinal wall and when there is a bacteria that's trying to get into the intestinal tissue, the IgA just grabs it and takes it along with it. Um, but it does not cause, sorry, but it does not uh, cause inflammation. So again, which is really important. Um, so what are the other properties of intestinal immune system? Typically there is a good distributed response. So whenever there is an activation of uh, immune cells such as T cell or B cell, these B and T cells typically are told where to go back, right? If it's skin, it goes back to that part of the body. If it's from the brain, it will go back to that part. Typically, in the intestine, what happens is these activated T and B cells not only go to the site of breach, but also along the cl closed by intestine. And that's important because once that there is a breach, those bacteria or microbes are present, can go along that intestinal wall pretty quickly. So that distributed response is important. However, it's also a private response. So even though those cells can go along uh, and provide immune response along the intestine, it, these activated cells typically don't end up in systemic circulation. So not every intestinal uh, infection causes problems where B and T cells are needed in the circulation. And as we talked about, most of the times the immune response is non-inflammatory and that's because of their uh, presence of inducible Tregs um, that are present in the intestine and they produce TGF-beta and IL-10, so our anti-inflammatory cytokines, which are important for the uh, non-inflammatory environment in the intestine. There are anti-inflammatory action of commensals, so apart from just um, making sure that they are competing against the pathogenic bacteria, they also produce some substances that help in uh, immune response or, you know, the, the pre, uh, formation of uh, particular types of uh, environment. So butyrate is produced that helps T helper cells to become ITregs. There is polysaccharide A that's produced and they uh, uh, have the T cells produce IL-10, so anti-inflammatory cytokines. Again, the, there are some other bacteria that help the dendritic cells in producing IL-10. If there is a pathogenic invasion, what happens? So instead of just having TGF-beta at rest when there is anti-inflammatory uh, environment, 
say if there is a path true pathogen, then you really need these T cells to not have an anti-inflammatory response, but have a good immune response. In those cases, the environment has not only TGF-beta, but also IL-6. In presence of TGF-beta and IL-6, as you can recall, there is TH17 response. So there are TH, uh, IL-17 and IL-21 uh, that are released, and they can bring in neutrophils, uh, immunoglobulins, and um, and an appropriate inflammatory response. If the immune system, um, what happens when the immune system goes wrong? We know that there can be allergic response, uh, there can be autoimmune issues. Um, so again, with allergies, it depends whether uh, we are talking about IgG versus IgE response in terms of uh, autoimmunity. It can, there can be a break in various layers of tolerance that we talked about. Uh, and in those cases, uh, we can have immune, uh, autoimmune dis disorders. A uh, couple of other causes of autoimmune is just gen having genetic defects, or we know all know about molecular mimicry, such as in strep, uh, strep A, and uh, that causes rheumatic fever. All right, the last topic is vaccines. Um, different types of vaccines, um, attenuated live or inactivated vaccines. In general, the response for inactivated vaccines is helper T cells and B cells versus for attenuated live vaccines, there is a helper T cell, B cell, and CTL response. There are different types of inactivated vaccines, so completely killed virus, so polio and influenza. It's killed, it's inactivated using something like formaldehyde and given in the vaccine versus there are some where it's just the toxoid that's purified and treated with some alum salts and given as a vaccine. Acellular, such as just a part of that cell is used like pertussis, or a subunit where the viral proteins are genetically engineered, such as in hepatitis B or HPV. And then carrier vaccine, so genes are introduced in a non-disease causing virus and used as um, Trojan horse. And then, of course, the mRNA vaccine that we know of at this point. And then attenuated vac live vaccine, it's important because it can provide herd immunity. It can have CTL response. Uh, however, it can cause infection in immunosuppressed. And um, if there is a mutation causing disease in immunocompetent host, that can be a problem as well. In general, uh, vaccines need some adjuvants. Why do we need adjuvants? Because there has to be there have to be two signals for any immune response. It's the first signal and the second signal. So in terms of vaccine, there has to be a danger signal and there has to be a uh, signal that it's not a self antigen, so foreign signal. So foreign signal is provided by the microbial protein. However, if it's genetically engineered, of it's given by, as an mRNA and then the protein is produced. However, if it's the toxoid, whichever it is, but it has to be a microbial protein that provides a foreign signal. The danger signal is provided by the adjuvant, and that can be MPL or alum. All right, so that's the end of the talk. Any questions?